In this video, we're going to learn about draft for molded applications. Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in this video, we're starting a brand new series talking about consumer product design. I recently put up a poll and I was curious what types of products people were interested in designing, and the vast majority were looking at consumer products. And while that doesn't necessarily mean injection molded parts, I think that is overwhelmingly the most complicated topic. So I do wanna start this new series talking about molded part design, and we're gonna mainly focus on molded part design for injection molding. Now I do wanna note that there are tons of different nuances to this. Things like roto molds and blow molds. These are going to be important for things like bottles or fluid cans, like gas cans or water cans. But there are also other types of applications. Things where we create molds from silicone that we can peel away from parts. And a lot of those cases, we can get away with breaking some of the standard rules. But again, for our series, I want to talk about the most basic application of injection molded plastic parts. This could also apply to casting or anything that requires draft. So you can go in the description of the video and you can download the data set that you see on the screen. And really all we're doing is we're talking about the difference between no draft, positive draft, and negative draft. So inside of this design, we have a folder called named views, and you can select on any of the three options, no draft, positive draft, or negative draft, and that'll allow us to zoom in on them. So first let's talk about no draft. Whenever we create designs for manufacture, if we're doing things like CNC milling, draft is not usually a requirement. And honestly, draft is probably a more complicated way to manufacture a part because most of the tools that we're gonna have access to are not gonna have any taper to them. So when we look at a design with no draft, what does that mean for us in terms of plastic parts? Well, most molds will have at least a core and a cavity. Again, there are nuances to this. Things like roto molds and blow molds are only gonna have a cavity because they use things like rotation and air in order to get the plastic out to the mold. But in most molded applications, we're going to have at least a core and a cavity. Now the core and the cavity, when they're put together, will leave an open space where our plastic part needs to be. So if we expand no draft and we hide the part, you can see that we're left with this opening between the two. So there are gonna be all kinds of different things that we need to understand about how molds work, but we don't necessarily need to get into the process of deciding uh, how to design the mold itself. That is a very specialized field. We just need to make sure that we understand the restrictions that we have on our end. One of the things that we do wanna make sure we understand as we go through this series is that when we're designing a molded part, we can get away with things like sharp corners in certain areas because when we machine the molds, we're actually machining the negative. So as we go through this process, we will end up creating the mold cores and cavities, but not in the, in the sort of the respect of creating an actual mold. We're only looking at it from a pure design perspective. But now that we see the space that's left between the mold and we understand that this is the basic process of creating a plastic part, Let's talk about why draft is important. So first, it's important to note that when plastic is molded, it is molten, it is liquid, and it's also injected at very high pressures. So when it's injected into our part, then it has to go through a high pressure state and also a cooling state to solidify it. Now, when plastic begins to cool, it starts to shrink. When it starts to shrink, we're able to pull the core away from it just fine and the cavity away from it just fine when it has draft. But when it doesn't have draft, it has a tendency to lock itself onto these pieces. Now, of course, it depends on things like the features of the part itself, but in general, we want to avoid a situation where the core that goes inside of our part doesn't have any draft at all. Now, there are special circumstances where we can get away with it, but they do tend to leave things like drag marks on the final part. So unless there's a very critical feature that is usually non-cosmetic on the inside of a part that needs to have no draft, we do want to avoid this. 
When we take a look at the positive draft, again, we have a core and a cavity. So as we pull the core out, you can see it gets further and further away from the part because of the draft. Now, in this case, we have 10 degrees on this wall. In general, we're probably going to have somewhere between 1 and 5 degrees at most. But this gives us a good representation of what happens. Now, you can see that the cavity also pulls away very easily. Now, when we think about this in terms of plastic cooling and shrinking, as this plastic part begins to shrink, it's going to automatically want to eject itself from the core and the cavity. It's just going to be the nature of the way that the part reacts when it starts to cool. So having the draft not only helps us eliminate those drag marks from removing it from the mold, but it also helps auto eject itself. So if we have a part that has a lot of draft on it, typically it's going to be very easy to remove from a mold. Now, molds have things called ejector pins, and typically those are placed on the inside or the non-visible surface of a part. Now, if you've ever taken apart any plastic designs and you've wondered how they're made, you'll see these little round pads, and typically they try to place them on top of support ribs or in areas that are really non-critical. But if you have a part that's very rounded, then oftentimes you'll see a little raised section in the base where they can put that round pin. It's important to note that each manufacturer might have different requirements. For example, if you're using a low production house, they might have certain pin sizes and all the pins must have flat ends. Where if you're doing a more large production run, you can have custom pins ground that meet the curve of your part and you can get away with more complex geometry. If we go to the negative draft, this is the worst case scenario. The negative draft, if we pull the core and the cavity apart, you can see that we can actually assemble this. There's plenty of room for these two pieces to go together. But if we take a look at the part itself, there is no way for this part to be removed once that plastic is injected. Because the plastic is gonna cool, it's automatically gonna lock itself onto this green piece, which is going to be our core. Now the core going into this yellow piece and locking itself into the red piece means that we're essentially creating one big thing and the plastic part is gonna be destroyed as soon as we try to remove it. There are cases where this might potentially work. If you're making a low run silicone mold where the mold itself is actually flexible and not rigid, sometimes you can get away with this. But it's not gonna be the focus of our series. We're gonna be talking about designing for production. So that's gonna be an important topic is for production, not necessarily the, you know, the custom silicone type molds that you make off of 3D prints that you can do in your garage. We're gonna focus on the topic of designing for a production. So with that said, this is going to be, again, the first line of videos in the series where we talk about producing plastic parts. There are a lot of different topics that we need to make sure that we understand before we get into the design phase. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to understand design decisions as we go. In the next video, I plan to talk about the internal features, things like internal walls and bosses, and how we can figure out the thickness, the, the amount of plastic that goes into those pieces. There are some standard design rules that we need to follow and understanding how we can plan those out ahead of time is gonna help us make the template for our design. I do wanna make one more note, the product design extension, which shows up on this plastic tools. Now I've covered these in a couple videos. I talked about all the new tools. We will not be using these throughout this design series. We're gonna be focusing on the standard design tools that we have at our disposal and we will be using both form tools as well as surfacing tools throughout this series. We're gonna to try to incorporate electronics. We're gonna have a fake PCB, potentially cameras and sensors and other things that I'm gonna to put together. And then we have to design a housing around it. But for right now, I do wanna focus on the pure basics of understanding the requirements of drafted design. If you have any questions so far, please let me know in the comments or you can send me an email, support at cadjucator.com. But as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.